that the panel was selected uh, for, we've got a European representative who just happens to live just around the corner from where the Treaty of Maastricht was signed. Whoa. And I always imagine when the Treaty of Maastricht was signed that uh, it was before I used to go to Maastricht very often. And uh, uh, it, I imagine it was in this really lovely old building, you know, lots of history, but it's actually a great big sort of pavilion, sort of like the Newcastle Sports Centre. <laughs> um, but uh, so Johan there is our European representative. I have a, a, a UK which is leading the the laboratory experiment in a way, uh, notwithstanding Ireland, on what happens when you run austerity. And I've got Bruce there as our UK representative. I've got, an, uh, the cause of all this problem was America. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I've got my American representative here, and I'm sort of just here just because I am. No, the success story. Uh, well, yeah. that's enough. So I've got, about three, I've got about five slides to motivate what my five minutes, which starts now. And, and the majority of my profession, and we're all economists on this panel, the majority of our profession seems to have forgotten the basics of macroeconomics. The first things you learn in macroeconomics that, that no matter how sophisticated you get up at, you know, you, you know, we've all done. Uh, years and years of uh, increasingly sophisticated macroeconomics, but they never actually, I think it was Paul Sweezy who said that, you know, the sequence of years in a standard economics program just adds all this fluff, but it doesn't add much more than what you learn in the first few weeks. Right, right. And uh, uh, the, the basics that are, these are facts, they're not opinions. And, and spending equals income, which equals output, which creates employment. That's the first thing you should learn in macroeconomics in a way. And it, and it, it continues to hold today. There are only three macro sectors, broadly. Private domestic sector, which includes households and firms who, who consume and invest. The external sector, where trade and financial flows occur. And the government sector, where fiscal policy and monetary policy. If these two sectors are not spending much or are draining demand so that output isn't growing, then there's only one sector left to fulfil this basic rule of macroeconomics. Which leads me to the next statement that fiscal contraction expansion is a myth. So when you, see, when you hear David Cameron in the UK talking about it, that, that we'll get more by cutting government spending and they appeal to all sorts of mathematical models and you know all concepts you know the, the economists will know about Ricardian equivalence and that this is this idea that all of us are not spending because we're, we're saving to save up for the future taxes that are going to be levied because they've got to pay back the deficits and so once we understand that they're going into uh, pushing towards surplus we'll suddenly spring up and spend again there's these notions that my profession puts out there and the politicians uh, mouth mindlessly. This fiscal contraction expansion is driving austerity everywhere. <laughs> Our own government in Australia believes it. That we've got to make room for private spending. There's another fallacy of composition. Keynes had a few good, very good fallacy compositions relating to savings and wage cuts. But there's another one that's very important, and this is this this is the IMF notion that you every nation will grow via export-led growth. Well, not every nation can be in balance of trade surplus or current account surplus. Most nations will always be in current account deficits, and when you've got a current account deficit, that means you're draining demand. In Australia now, we're having a once in a hundred year mining boom, but the external sector is still draining demand because of the what go, going out on the, the primary and secondary income account. And so it's a fallacy of composition in Europe. There, there's never been a case in history where you've had a major fiscal consolidation and the economy has grown when everybody else is doing it. The cases they wheel out are Denmark in the 80s, yeah, but everyone else was growing at that time and so they could exploit the growth of everyone else to e export. When everybody's running austerity programs, you can't export your way out of a recession. 
you can't get more spending to create more income when you're cutting that and that. That's flat by doing that if everybody's doing it. It doesn't work. One nation's exports is an imports is another nation's exports. Imports are a function of low domestic income. And the other thing I'd like to say is that government deficits are normal. This period that we've been through in the last 15 years where private sector has been uh, dis-saving and, and, and maintaining consumption via credit and the governments have been able to run surpluses because of the, the high levels of activity are very atypical in our history. This is the European situation. This is the blue, the, the blue are the, the average output gaps between 1975 and 1997, the recessions that occurred in this period. Now I caution you that these are estimated uh, via the conservative sort of techniques that the IMF and the OECD use, so they're always biased downwards because they have a notion of potential output which is always uh, uh, a higher unemployment rate than is feasible. But we take them on their face value. The blue, the grey bars, if you can see them, are the recent output gaps. Now why I showed you that graph is because, oh sorry, uh, is because <coughs> the, the whole edifice of constraints through the stability and growth package, which Johan and I in our recent book said was neither stability nor growth, but the whole, whole constructs that were used ex post once the Maastricht Treaty was signed, they then went for a series of ad hoc justifications on why the 3% rule was a sensible rule, were predicated on the fact that they believed that out the, the, the maximum output gap that they would ever hit was a 3% output gap. Now most of these output gaps are more than 3%. So another, and, and what, that, what that leads us to is, uh, I did a calculation the other day, and I just used all of the standard elasticities which are always biased in favour of the neoliberal view, the standard output gaps, and I estimated uh, the, the, this is the OECD output gap, and what I did was I, I simulated using air elasticities for tax responses to output gaps and spending responses, and I came up with the ex estimated cyclical deficit that they that would produce. Now that's always biased downwards from what the true value is. And uh, I then was able to calculate their structural deficit based upon what the actual figures are. And if you look at this, most of these would just, even the cyclical component would blow out the mastery criteria and force pro-cyclical response. Even just the, and for those who are not economists, the cyclical component has got nothing to do with changes in government policy. It's just what automatically happens when the level of activity changes and taxation receipts fall or rise and government spending falls or rise just because of the existing policy. So irrespective of what the governments were doing in a discretionary sense, running fiscal stimulus packages, their cyclical deficits would blew the, blew the Maastricht criteria out of the water. And the last thing, I'll, last couple of points that I will make is that, that we've, we've, we've been told a great number of mistruths about the way the macroeconomy works. The first statement I make is that bond markets do matter in the Eurozone because, as Randy said before, all of those countries use a foreign currency, the Euro. Australia doesn't use a foreign currency because we, the, our national government issues it, the Australian dollar. Most countries issue their own currency and therefore they, they don't face any financial constraints on, this, on their spending. That's not to say they should spend infinitely, it just means that they can spend what they like. The Euro governments are, uh, need to finance their spending because they use a currency that they don't issue. Therefore bond markets do matter to them and that's become the problem. Although they only matter while the European Central Bank allow them to matter. And as we've seen recently, the Euro Central, Euro, European Central Bank has essentially played the bond markets out of the picture by buying up the government debt in secondary bond markets, in secondary bond markets, and therefore declaring the bond markets irrelevant even in that constrained situation. Bond markets don't matter anywhere else. Though bond markets in, in countries like Australia are parasitic entities. They, they are uh, enjoying corporate welfare in the, in the form of a risk-free annuity 
and because the governments don't even need to borrow. Austerity begets austerity. This is, you know, we've seen it just in Australia last week. The government's been relentlessly now pursuing a surplus. If you look at yesterday's national accounts, you'll see that the government contribution is now minus 0.6 to real growth. So it's, and, and last <coughs> quarter, June quarter, it was 0.2% positive. There's been a 0.8% percentage point <coughs> swing, and that's quite a fiscal contraction in one quarter. And, and what did we see in the mid-year financial statement? We saw that their deficit went up by 10, 10 billion more than they expected. Why? Because their tax revenue was down more than they expected. Why? Because the economic activity around the world has fallen. And so once you pursue austerity, you're seeing it in Britain, you're seeing it in Ireland, you cannot reasonably get all these financial ratios down by pursuing austerity. The way for European countries to pro progress is by growth. The only reason the European system hasn't collapsed into insolvency is because the European Central Bank is intervening. That's a fact. And so that should be really a guise, a, a guide to, to the way in which to reform the system. But the, the, the cost of this intervention is in the enforced austerity. It's not, the ECB should be saying to governments, run higher deficits, grow your economies, get some stability into your system, and we'll fund the whole lot. And this leads me to my last point. The two options are, for the Eurozone, are they either go to a full federal system like Australia, or the US. That is, that they create a central fiscal authority which is intertwined with the European Central Bank, that it's, that it's democratically elected, and has responsibility for managing mm. shocks that occur across the member states. I can't see that happening for a range of the region which, which our European uh, representative might want to talk about, cultural, political, historical, the rest of it. The, the, the recommended option is that they have, an, they have a discussion at today's summit in, in uh, Brussels and they recommend an orderly dismantling of the Eurozone, they restore currency sovereignty and they allow their exchange rates then to, to adjust and in not that distant, it would be highly uh, uh, disruptive in the short run, but in the not too distant future, you would see Greece, lots of Germans uh, driving south to Greece because the exchange rate would attract their tourism. And, and those countries then could play the bond markets out of the game, run their own deficits, pursue their own growth, and uh, that would be the way out of the crisis. So uh, the la last thing I'd say is that uh, Randy and I run blogs, which give you a lot of information about modern monetary theory, the sort of macroeconomics that I've been talking about, and there's, a, there's some addresses. So that's my six minutes. <laughs> so, what's the guy's name? Elastic concept. What? You're saying how elastic was your concept? <laughs> well, yeah, I can't bear to see the clock. <laughs> uh, would you like to go next? Yeah, it's a good thing. Bill went through most of the theory, so I can go more quickly through mine. Um, yeah, mostly what I want to do is present a, a series of um, graphs that show data. <coughs> uh, Bill already did this. Okay, so if one sector is going to run a surplus, another sector has to run a deficit. Okay, that's a key to understanding what's going to follow. The Eurozone crisis, uh, the false claim is that it was driven by out of control government spending, especially on the periphery, by these Mediterraneans who can't control themselves, and especially <laughs> on social programs. This is the story they tell you all the Greeks are retiring at really young ages and they have very uh, uh, generous uh, benefit packages. The reality is that many of these countries actually were the paragons of fiscal discipline running actually budget services <coughs> before the crisis. The three real problems are excessive private sector debt and lax lending by banks, exactly the same problem as in the U.S. occurred um, throughout Europe. Germany's uh, mercantilism, insistence that it will run budget, uh, current account <coughs> surpluses. And finally, the real problem is that the EMU was designed to fail. It could not succeed, and this is not some 
uh, new religion that I found. I was arguing this in 1998, that it will fail, it will, you could foresee it very easily. First, the deficits were not out of control before the crisis. You can see across all the countries, even the Mediterraneans, their deficits were not out of control. Government debt as a percent of GDP was not out of control. It was not rising on trend in any of these countries until the crisis. Net debt as a percent of GDP. On the left-hand side, we have the government debt, and this is by year. So you see before the crisis, the first dot shows you what the debt ratios are. My argument is none of these would be an unreasonable debt ratio for any sovereign country that issues its own currency. The private sector debts, however, were huge. Okay? And in uh, a couple of cases, close to the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, private sector debt ratios. So it really is a private sector debt problem that became a government debt problem when some of these nations chose to bail out their banks. And so they, especially Ireland is the and uh, Iceland uh, is the best example of a Euro nation that did that. Um, getting to uh, Bill's uh, comments about the sectoral balances. Um, this is a nice way to display these if you haven't seen it before. Um, if we look at the euro area as a whole, it basically runs a balanced current account. So we see little tiny blues here in recent years. They've been running uh, current account uh, surpluses. The sign is reversed. We see the uh, private sector balance, which has been positive all the time except back in 2000. That means the private sector taken as a whole is saving. And that has to be identically equal to the sum of the government's balance and the foreign balance. Since foreign balance is just about zero, the government deficit is allowing the private sector to save. And you can see that there is a cyclical nature here, but it, it always balances. Here is Germany. Uh, Germany runs a very large current account surplus. It accounts for about 80% of all the current account surpluses among the Euro nations. And that allows it to have a very small government deficit while the private sector has huge savings. Okay, and this is why Germany doesn't have the private sector debt problem because its private sector is allowed to save because they export to the rest of Europe. Here is France, which has a, not a large, but a, a positive current account deficit plus its private saving equals its budget deficit. So the reason that its budget deficit has grown tremendously is because the private sector got scared in their saving. They're not spending. That creates the uh, government sector deficits. Here is Spain. Spain looks something like the U.S., but even worse. Uh, very large private sector deficits. And that allowed Spain to be the paragon of fiscal responsibility with government sector surpluses. And uh, that uh, has reversed. Now the private sector got scared. They are running uh, positive saving, and so the government deficit exploded. Here is Italy, um, current account deficits with small private sector surpluses equals the government deficit. Okay, so the story is very obvious, this is not a case of runaway government spending. It's a case of the deficit being the balancing item to the current account deficit plus the saving of the private sector. Um, the euro is the, the problem. Let me wa wave your hand because I have several more slides, but I don't have to do all of them now. Um, the euro is the problem. By adopting the euro, the sovereign nations have turned into some of the U.S. states, as I was saying at the last session. Unlike U.S. states, Euro governments have to fund pensions and health care. We don't ask California and New York to fund the pensions and the health care of their entire populations. The federal government does that more or less. You know that our yes. federal government <laughs> is not <laughs> generous <laughs> in these things. Okay. Um, Euro governments had to deal with uh, not only pensions and health care, but also banking problems. Again, we don't ask our states to bail out the banks when you have a banking crisis. But the Euro states had to do that. Here are the um, US states' uh, debt to GDP ratios. These are the, some of the biggest ones. And as I said, they're nothing like 60% of GDP. The markets will shut them down if they um, try to increase their uh, debt ratios. But 
just very low numbers. Now we do have a, a state um, deficit and debt problem uh, in the U.S. now. I think in California, about one third of the government spending is deficit uh, finance spending. Uh, social spending, you can see that in, contrary to the story that's always told about the Mediterraneans, they don't have generous social safety nets. Uh, Greece's is uh, much less than Germany's and France's and so on. Um, what, what is the center really trying to do? They're trying to protect their banks. They don't want to get stuck. France and Germany don't want to get stuck bailing out their banks. This is why they're insisting that Greece and Italy and uh, Spain have to service their debt, they have to use austerity, try to squeeze the last euro possible out of the populations to postpone the inevitable, which is these banks are going to fail. So you can see that most of Italy's um, debt is held in uh, France. The story will change a bit depending on the country, but that really is the problem. What's the solution? Bill already said it. They're going to very likely go back to their own currencies because, as Bill said, it just doesn't seem likely that you're going to get uh, Germany and probably not even France to agree to the things that actually would resolve the problem, which is either to give the European Parliament a budget of 20% of uh, European GDP. Right now it's only about $100 billion equivalent, much less than 1%, so you would have to have 20 times the spending available to the European Parliament to be redistributed among the states. I don't believe that's going to happen. Or the ECB stand ready and say, we will buy all Greek debt uh, and guarantee a 3% interest rate. That's not going to happen either, so it's much more likely that they will go back. How do they do it? You mm -hmm. just, the government immediately announces from now on, we spend in drachma or lira or whatever, and we tax in drachma or lira. Now, Warren would not change private contracts. He would leave those in euros. This is something we can discuss. It solves some problems and creates some problems, but it could be the easiest way to go. Thank you. Uh, okay, I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm going to talk a little bit about the politics of debt uh, uh, and austerity in the UK, and then come on and talk about some of the outcomes, some of the experiences of people who are. Uh, having with regard to it. Um, I mean, in the UK, we had an election last year, and uh, one of the main disputes in the election between the main parties, the Conservatives and the Labour Party, was over the, the speed with which uh, debt reduction was brought in. Both were, in some sense, committed to trying to get the public spending um, in hand. Um, Labour were committed to a, a gradual process of trying to reduce government spending, uh, whereas Conservatives, kind of somewhat in a throwback to Thatcherism, uh, were committed to deep cuts, deep cuts in public spending, um, you know, policies aimed at encouraging, supposedly encouraging sort of private sector, private sector growth. The result of that election was uh, the first. Um, coalition government for many, many years uh, in the UK, uh, with the Liberal Democrats holding the balance of power. So we got the emergence of what's been called the Condem uh, government, <laughs> Conservatives and uh, Liberal Democrats. I, I, I think that's quite funny, although to some extent I think the Liberal Democrats sold out the people that voted for them. Um, um, so um, I, I think Dem Com might have been a more, uh, uh, more appropriate um, term. I got more than 30 pieces of silver. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, with the result, I mean, some of the policies that have already been instituted by the Labour Party were things like a public sector pay freeze, which we're, we're in the, you know, we've had for at least two years, uh, public sector pay freeze. Um, but with the Conservatives, what that's also meaning is it's actually mean, meaning quite deep cuts in public spending. I think there was an acceptance among public sector workers that with, uh, with um, recession, uh, public sector pay freeze was actually a fairly good deal uh, to some extent, um, or it was accepted. Uh, but now that the cuts are far deeper and we're talking about fairly substantial job losses 
in the um, in the public sector, um, with its clear implications for aggregate demand in the economy. Um, um, and so the, the depths of these cuts have been sort of criticised um, quite weakly, I would say, by the Labour Party. And it could have gone much further in terms of sort of trying to maintain aggregate demand. So that's the kind of political background. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to give some fairly sort of anecdotal facts, as it were, about what some of this austerity entails. In the UK, you've had uh, health expenditure and local government expenditure frozen. Um, we, we heard about, say, um, so to take a specific example, in, in, in the next door we heard about um, mental health projects. This is one of the things that's being hit in the UK. Cinderella projects, um, these are being hit quite hard. Uh, projects concerning some social exclusion, Obviously, we had the summer of discontent uh, last year, um, rioting on the streets, shop being burned down. It looked like um, fairly. I mean, I'm sure you saw the pictures around the world. Um, you know, it, it did somewhat kick off. Um, in terms of education, this, of course, is a system that will bring total anecdotal anecdotes or evidence related to me. Actually, in terms of the uh, education system. Students in the UK at the, at the moment pay £3,000 a year for their uh, uh, higher education, for their university studies at undergraduate level, um, and there was a government subsidy, which for most universities runs around five or £6,000 per year per student. Now that's been abolished, so students starting uh, in September will be paying £9,000 a year fee. There will be a merger, fee only debt, with 27, to multiply those quite quickly, <laughs> 27, 27 uh, thousand pounds worth of fee debt alone. Now you think you're emerging from a, what, what, what do you aspire? You aspire to get a good job, you aspire to take on a mortgage, to build up a deposit, to pay for a house, to have a family. You've got 27 thousand pounds worth of fee debt, and that's before you add on your living expenditure at the time you're a student. You know, I, I emerged with from my university studies with about seven thousand pounds worth of debt. I think students they're gonna be well over fifty thousand pounds worth of debt. Um, this is just you, you, you could cry, you know. Um, in terms of how some of the other changes are affecting real people, um, the Labour government have been actually quite uh, generous in terms of supporting families. Uh, families, in particular uh, working families, uh, things like working family tax credits, uh, these were policies which m middle earners were encouraged through, um, through the tax system, uh, were, were supported. These have been cut. Um, I'm just into the second tier tax, paying that tax rate has risen from 40 to 42%. This year, uh, family allowance, which was uh, introduced by the uh, Labour government in 1945, uh, that's been abolished, or it's been means tested. Anyone into the second tax bracket will be losing that. I've got two young children, that's £134 a month I'll be losing. On top of my family tax credits with a two year public sector pay freeze, um, with the fear of what's happening vis-a-vis -vis student numbers going forward. For someone who's fundamentally middle class, despite, you know, in, in, in terms of income and stuff like that, these things are really, really beginning to bite. Um, I was on strike uh, the Wednesday before we flew, I flew here. Uh, industrial unrest is coming in, and this is over pension reform. Um, they're talking about raising the uh, retirement age to 68, so that you can take your pension, um, increasing my contributions by around 30% a month, and uh, reducing my actual pension when I retire. That's why I went on strike. Pay freezes I've been able to cope with. The loss of family allowances, well, that's bourgeois democracy. I turned up and voted. 
but having worked for 20 years in the public sector with lower average wages through that period, the, 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 the quid pro quo for that was actually better pensions, the private sector pensions. Um, these are something which, um, which, you know, we've we've had three strike days over this. And unfortunately, I'm the teachers' pension scheme, so when we go out, we go out with the teachers, which is fantastic because the private sector grinds to a halt as well because kids people to stay at home and look after their kids. <laughs> um, and in the in the in the press, in the final two points, um, in the press. Um, <coughs> You find that this is now being portrayed rather than a problem that started in the financial sector and which is to do with, um, <coughs> you know, with yeah, financial crisis. It's now emerging into a pro conflict seemingly between public and private sector workers. Um, it's a sort of classic divide and rule uh, problem. Um, and, and find a lot of private sector workers are, have bought the line about the generosity of public sector pensions in the UK. A little bit like in the UK press, the story of the lazy Greeks laid on the beach eating olives is something that's, that's pushed quite strongly. So that's, that's a view from the UK. Um, <laughs> things are quite bad. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, the economics of the situation have been sketched already extensively both by Bill and by Randy, and suffice to say that I agree with most of what they said, and I would like to give some different observations from a slightly different perspective. I have three major observations. <coughs> the first one is a very personal one, which has to do with the fact that I'm now already six weeks out of Europe, and I want to mention that it gives you really the opportunity to have a different perspective. You should realize that when you are in Europe, at least in the Netherlands, you are bombarded every day by every utterance of every politician all the time. So you have, in a way, no time to reflect and to take distance of what's going on. And being away and, well, on page four of the City Morning Herald, you might find a snippet, a snippet of information between the Murray Dam River discussions and AOP discussions, etc. What's going on in Europe gives you a certain perspective, which is very good. Because as all of a sudden realized, the enormous lack of democratic processes behind the whole uh, things which are going on in Europe. And I realized that when I, <coughs> when I, um, when we were discussing the introduction of the Euro in Maastricht, uh, of course, we were very keen on that, I was against it. And I was against it, I realized to my surprise, I must admit, but when I recollected that, I was against precisely because of the lack of democratic process of the <coughs> of the introduction of the euro. So I was very much in favor of the introduction of the euro, but then in a democratic environment where you would have proper institutions which would control its, its, um, its effectuating. And if you look at the way things are going now, the, 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 the roles Merkel and Sarkozy play and the power they are given implicitly is incredible. I, I, I'm really surprised of being so far away to, to see it and to realize that. And it also makes me aware of the lack of fuel encouraged by leading politicians. I'll come back to that in my third point. My second point is, and I want to point that out, which because that tend, tends to be a little bit small in all these economic perspectives, is the political and social nature actually of the whole European adventure, if I may put it out, point it out that way. What you should realize is that you should look at Europe as a project beyond economics, I think. Um, and when I talk to my students about it, I compare it often to the decision of Helmut Kohl at the German unification to set the Ostmark one to one with the, with the German mark, with the Deutsche mark, which was very wrong. I mean, all economists, economists advised him not to do that, and they had very good reasons not to do that. And he was very right to do it, I think, a very courageous to do it, although it was wrong from an economic perspective. Well, in the same way, you should realize that before the euro was introduced, all these American authors were laughing the heads off. And there were long articles why the European, why Europe is not the uh, uh, optimal currency union. And essentially nobody contested that. Nobody claimed that Europe was an optimal currency union. Nonetheless, we decided to go on with it. And that was basically the same reason as the one-to-one -one conversion of the Deutsche Mark to the Ostmark Helmut Kohl did, that we had other reasons to introduce the euro. Uh, next, of course, to big economic interest by all parties and all conspiracies and what knows what, but 
in the public opinion, a very strong undercurrent was that we should have a united Europe. And that was really what was driving basically the, the, the big support at that time. At that time, there was a big support and a big enthusiasm for the European process. Um, and that brings me to my third point. That is that before the, uh, the Euro, uh, before the Master Treaty was drafted, there was immense discussion about the EMU versus the EPU. The EPU stands for European Political Union and the EMU stands for European Monetary Union. And the proponents of the EPU said, well, we should have a political union, then we can have a monetary union. I was one of those, to be honest. And um, others said, well, let's first have a monetary union. Some said, let's stick to the monetary union. Others said, well, if we have a monetary union, we will be forced to have a political union. It's a chicken egg problem. And once we have the monetary union, inevitably we will have the political union as a consequence. And this is basically what's going on now. So now you see that we are forced, basically, to have the discussion, do we want to have a political union or not? And also, as a consequence, I think at least, do we will have, in the end, a democratic structure which supports that or not? And ironically enough, the proposals which are which are being, which I perceive from the media here, are that indeed we will have this political union because the federal thing uh, uh, Bill was talking about is basically rather consistent in a non-democratic way, but technically is rather consistent with the Europa plan, etc. So you will have indeed a European government which is 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 um, is, is the defining the fiscal policies of the member states in a way, and also setting the boundaries. So, ironically enough, the European Political Union uh, adherents get, get their political union to a certain extent, but it's not a political union. It's an enforced union by the financial markets. And that's the very strange situation that, that somehow the, the politicians are not courageous enough to have their own point of view and to say, we want to have Europe for this and this reason, and we want to overcome these and these problems for this and this reason, because we, have, we want to have a unified Europe, because we had all these wars in the past, because you should realize that Portugal not that long ago had the, had the military regime, Greek not that long, not, not long time ago had the military regime, etc. We want to have to have these things in the future. We want to have a coherent union nowadays, and therefore we should have a dream, etc., etc., etc. What, what basically what Cole and Mitterrand in those days did, and, and, and then from that vision they should be uh, advancing a, a European Union, which indeed. Um, supports the member states in many ways, and, and that's that's a system which is at this moment not going to happen. And I'm, 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 I, I cannot say whether it will happen or not, but I hope it will. <coughs> All right, so we throw it open to just general discussion, and I'll just monitor the order of people putting their hands up. Yeah. Um, just one technical one for, to help my understanding. Uh, I'm Peter Harkin from Swindon. Um, if the uh, individual countries uh, were to bring back their sovereign currencies, um, and I forget who it was, Randy, I think perhaps would say, that they would from then on start uh, taxing and spending in their own currencies, um, I can see that sort of liberates them, which is what you, and enables them to run deficits and so on, which is presumably why you think that can solve the problem. And that sounds right, I agree. I'm just thinking, would any country still have the euro? I, I, it seems to me not. And what would happen to all that euro debt? Um, how would they pay that off eventually? Would the euro just be a currency that was not active anymore, except there was a big deficit around, and there would be a, a, an exchange rate between the euro and their sovereign currency, and that's slowly paid off? Or can you flesh out that part of the problem? Yeah. I guess it's you, Randy, because did you can say that, I think? Well, someone so, so the, the protocol will be, if you've got a specific question for a person, you can ask it. If you just want the general panel to comment, we'll, we'll do it that way. So, yeah. I don't mind who answers it. Uh, you know, I don't think that, they'll, uh, that any country will retain the euro when, the, uh, when countries start chumping shit. Uh, the euro debt, it, it will depend. Uh, as I said, there's no reason why Greece or Italy, when they leave, to re-denominate private debt in the new currency. They could leave it in Europe. Mm -hmm. The problem is that if it's uh, domestic households with mortgages in euros, and their incomes in lira, with a tremendous devaluation <laughs> relative to the euro, which will, of course, help solve the current account uh, deficits, 
Uh, they're probably going to default. Uh, but that's an easy problem to resolve domestically <coughs> because you uh, now have the lira the government can build new houses mm -hmm. for them or give them lira to buy their house back from the bank and so on. Uh, it, it eases some of the, the problems with uh, firms that want to continue uh, uh, having trade relations with the rest of Europe that their debts are still going to remain in euros and they have to hold on their debt. The problem if you um, re-denominate all debt is that you're going to be tied up in the courts for a very long time. Why? Well, because uh, yeah, you, you've got contracts in euros and it, if the, the government can always re-denominate all of its debt in the new currency. But re-denominating private debts means you're going to be, and you're trying to operate in France, you're going to be subject to um, European court ruling. That's a default. Uh, no, I, well, I, I mean, we just don't know, do we, whether it's going to disintegrate or not. And I, I wonder whether there might not be a core left comprising France, Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, Holland. That would be a possibility, I think. I think the problem is they're going to be so overvalued relative to all the countries. Mm -hmm. They're no longer, Germany won't be able to. Well, two brief comments. First of all, if you look at the exchange rate between the Deutschmark and the Dutch builder before the euro, you can put a ruler along it. So we were effectively having the Deutschmark also before the euro was there. Uh, that's one comment. Um, and the other comment is indeed, I, I cannot understand the German attitude because they are in a way committing suicide. Because what you should realize, and I will argue that later on in my talk also, they are heavily dependent on net exports to the rest of Europe. And if they if they kill off the, the euro, they're exploded. They will implode. Mm. But I will come back to that in a moment. Yeah, well, not really. I'll just go back to what the Bundesbank always did, and that's, that's managed their exchange rate. Mm. They'll ensure trade competitiveness through the exchange rate. And the German tourists will make sure the Greek exchange rate doesn't fall through the rules. <laughs> Uh, the next question was Martin. Yes, a, a comment for Bruce. Um, I'm surprised you didn't mention that really the um, response of the Conservative, well, I wouldn't even mention it, Lib Dems, since they've sold out, um, their reaction to the, you know, the fiscal crisis, blah, blah, I mean, has been a wonderful pretext in terms of re. Um, emphasizing reintroducing neoliberalism, I mean, small government, privatization, um, and you know, you sink or swim a very much an individualistic perspective and their reaction to the riots was classic in terms of, you know, we've got two types of people in society. We've got the hard working, probably God fearing responsible members of society and we've got, you know, the unwashed. Um, and we don't need to actually you know, take any account of their, uh, you know, the lack of jobs and their uh, labour force status. They're just people that need to be re-educated, you know, etc., etc., etc. Yes. Yeah. Do you want me to respond? Or? Oh, you can respond if you wish, or uh, just agree with I, 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 I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think to, to some extent it's been a the financial crisis and the problems with public debt spending have also been a kind of a smokescreen in which there's been there's been a land grab from the private sector against the public sector as well, and that that's a strong undercurrent to it. I would agree. It is a, re it is a return to Thatcherism. Yeah, and big society and voluntary <coughs> this and that. And, and the history. most extraordinary thing about it is that. You know, you're starting to hear again, even here in Australia, but certainly in, in Europe and America, the, the sort of the themes that were around in the in the 90, late nineties, before the crisis, that you know the the, the 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 construction of events like the unemployed are now to blame for their own circumstances, and that uh, you know that the uh, governments are inefficient and light and uh, and wasteful. So all of these things, are, you know, and we're just missing the elephant in the room. 
problems. You know, we've, we've, the, the, all of the discussion is going back to that reassertion, mm -hmm. and in a way, the austerity is a, is a smokescreen for, for for finishing off the agenda mm. that started in the 1980s in most countries, and that was to wipe out the role of government in in the allocation process as much as they possibly could, or the reallocation. And it's been it's been dressed up as you know mm. we've got to have fiscal conservatism and we've got to have this and that, but it's really just a, they've just renewed the agenda. It's as if the financial crisis and its causes have just been completely obliterated, and we're just marching headlong back to the <coughs> situation that generated the crisis in the first place. All right, so uh, John. This is a comment on something you said, Bill. Um, one of your facts was that we, in Australia, we always have deficits. That's almost true. But not I did I said normally. Sorry, normally have deficits, right. That's mm -hmm. not entirely true. When we've had genuine foreign employment in Australia, it's usually been in war times, and not surprisingly, we have deficits. But there are some quite long periods in Australian history where we've had genuine full employment without having any war or those sort of things. The last one was in the first 25 years after the Second World War, where we had genuine full employment. And although we had an expanding um, uh, role of uh, social security payments, which expanded reasonably quickly, we nevertheless had substantial surpluses because of the automatic stabilisers. So if we do get genuine full employment without a war, it will probably be a government surplus. Uh, I've got a list here. James is next. Okay, thank you. Yeah, let's come back to the elephant in the room and the, the three sector story. Uh, accepting that the private sector debt has been driving um, the public sector debt, uh, <laughs> In the case of a country like Ireland, I mean, or Iceland, we know the banks have really driven the problem. But what about the, the big sort of countries? What, why have they suffered so much uh, in terms of that three sector story? Mm. Um, I said I was showing my talk later on, but I'm not going to have too much. Uh, there are two reasons, I think. One of the main reasons is the, the very low interest rate, the very relatively low interest rate. You should realize that prior to the accession to the euro, these countries had, had normal interest rates in the range of 10% or something like this. And now they have real interest rates in the, in the, in the range of 1.6%. So, so that was an enormous stimulus to accept credit and, and, and to, to accept debts. And if you look at the consumer credit story, which I also talked about yesterday, you will see that this holds exactly for Greece, Portugal, and, and Spain, for instance, and the real estate booms and all these things. So that's one of the main elements which has driven the but in uh, several countries, you had major housing booms, just like the United States, and you have um, <coughs> possibly because of low interest rates, you have um, consumers trying to maintain or increase living standards while their wages are going down in real terms. Same story as the U.S., but I think in at least some of the countries, that's the story. You know, the, the other point about it is that. Germany appears to be the strong economy in this country. Germany, the, the weak economies are just the mirror of the, of the strong economy. Germany wouldn't have been able to, to Germany when they entered the Euro, previously the Bundesbank, as I said before, maintained its competitiveness for exchange rate and inflation. Once they lost their capacity, they had to maintain their competitiveness in another way. They brought in the Hartz reforms which were a really big attack on the labour market. And you see real wages in Germany have virtually been static over the period from about 2003 through to now. And they suppress domestic demand in a you know, significant way. And so all the, all the capital that was getting stored up in Germany went south and, and, and built the capacity for the southern states to buy the exports back from the, from the Germans. You know, why, why do you, there's, there's a big debate upon the, at the moment of, uh, in Portugal about whether they should have this fast train. 
and all of the economic studies have shown that, that they would be mad to invest in that fast train because it just will go broke. And who's pushing it? The French government, the German government are sending representatives down to Lisbon, you know, by the week to, to push the fast train on the Portuguese government. And why? Because the French and German suppliers of the fast train. <laughs> The same as the military equipment, the, uh, the, the second-hand equipment and stuff that the Germans flogged to both Turkey and Greece to exploit their mutual paranoia with each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the next one was... Uh, oh, Ricardo. Oh, yes, thanks. I had a question for you, Bill. In your slides you said, or in your talk you said that there's two ways out of you. One is get a fiscal control from Brussels. Fiscal authority in Brussels. I didn't say authority. I said a fully democratically elected fiscal okay. government. Uh, That's the national one. government. The second option is go back to the second option is go back to sovereign currencies in, in all the countries. Which of these two options is the preferred one in short run to get out of this crisis, and which one is the preferred one in the long run? Well, I, I just want to say something uh, taking up from um, Johan. You know, I think the the European project is a good idea, um, and I think that the arguments that first we need the euro and then we'll do the political stuff was complete nonsense. It makes no. There are very few advantages to see that you gain from the euro. Okay, and in fact, what we now see is it is what is driving them apart. The reason why the Italians now hate the Germans is because of the Euro. It's not the politics. Okay, so I think that they did it exactly the wrong way around. So I, I think the, the goal should be to try to keep them together, but the problem is the Euro, and you can't get them together now <coughs> with the Euro, the way that it is set up. So you've got to solve that problem first. And if you don't solve it, then they've got to leave the Euro. And then that's the, probably the end of the project for quite a while. Yeah, I think in answer to your question, the short run, the best short run solution is that the ECB publicly declare that it will fund each of the member states' deficits and that they are pro-growth and therefore that they, that they, they uh, uh, prioritise employment creation and uh, public sector infrastructure investment and that the ECB just publicly says we'll do that we reject all of the sort of old Bundesbank ideas that we're going to have hyperinflation and make that a public statement. That's the best short-run solution right now. The best long-run solution, mm -hmm. given, the, given that an economic union isn't going to work, uh, is to dissolve the union and work really hard to restore the political union. And just, they made it much more difficult by adding more and more countries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and that, that makes one doubt that really the goal is European Union. Actually, it's to bust labor, to get rid of the social safety net, to have low-cost countries on the periphery and move all the German jobs there. I think that actually is the long-term goal. I mean, yeah, the, the, there was one interesting thing that when uh, Papa Drail, the Greek Prime Minister, announced the, the possibility of a referendum on the latest austerity measures. First, uh, Sarkozy and Merkel came in and said, well, um, you know, Can't get democracy. We, we're not going to renegotiate this package. You either, you either have it or you don't. But then the European Commission came in and said, if Greek, Greece leaves the euro, they also leave the European Union. That's bullying. It's incredible bullying. Because you leave the European Union, you know, your access to markets, you know, all the things that go with this. This was, this was so sort of high pressure, high pressure stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, that's the thing is it, there is, a, there is a power structure which is going on mm -hmm. um, within the European Union. And um, I don't know how you, you can get away with that without long-term fundamental redistribution of income within the European Union, which isn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, a brief comment about, uh, upon the enlargement of the European Union. I think it's good that, 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 well, first of all, it's not a homogeneous entity, the European Union, of course, there are fractions and there are, there are, there are powers to be and whatever. So, so one of the stories is that indeed some 
some of the fractions within the Europe, those who are not in favor of a democratic Europe, to be more precise, they are encouraging more and more members because they are quite convinced that the more and more members come, the more and more difficult it will be to have a new democratic Europe. So, so that's, that's one of the stories I have heard quite often, to be honest. And, and, then, and on the other hand, you have, of course, the idealists who say, well, if these poor people, why should we keep the door closed, etc., etc.? So, so, so it's a very diverse picture, actually, as you're facing more in general, also, I think. So I think we've got very limited amount of time, but there's a few more questions, so let's be as quickly as Can I just ask the panel to comment on the relationship between the economic situation in the US and Europe and the war in the Middle East and Afghanistan? After you, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Is, is, some would say that war is quite stimulating to the exactly. economy because there's constant production. <coughs> like, you know, the US wants enemies, that's true. Mm -hmm. um, and Obama's last year the union address made it very clear China is going to be the new enemy. Mm -hmm. And that will be the justification for doing lots of stuff, including <laughs> clamping down on uh, uh, freedom at home and possibly also stimulating the economy with military. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would add that it also may be part of a sort of neoliberal agenda. I mean, I, I would liken it maybe to 1867, where uh, U.S. warships sailed into Tokyo Bay and, and trained their guns on the city and said, "Next year we'll be back opening the shops for us." And um, you know that um, I, I think uh, in, in terms of commodities like oil and things like that, I think a lot of this Middle East thing is, is to do with trying to and West's intervention to are to do with actually getting access to markets. So in, in, that, in that sense, I think that a sort of neoliberal agenda is perhaps a common denominator. In terms of um, sort of, in terms of it as a sort of Keynesian type war policy, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure because it is public expenditure again, which is something which is certainly under attack in the UK. You're very mindset. Uh, Louise Begar from United Voice. So um, I actually enjoyed the panel a lot, the panel discussion a lot, and I think the problem of austerity was articulated quite well, um, as well as the issue of a lack of political will and the defaulting of a neoliberal ideology, as well as the lack of democratic process. And I liked the fact that it was raised quite well that we've, it seems to be forgotten completely that this crisis was brought by capital and not actually by the household sector. Um, and I think part of this is requiring the political constituency to sort of force change onto the policymakers. So my question is, and in particular to the um, international panelists, what is the um, what is the feeling on the ground in your particular region? Do you feel that um, there is, you know, for example, the Occupy movements that have been sort of springing up and the anti-neoliberal um, uh, grassroots organisations that have been being um, Bringing up out of, out of this crisis, do you think they're gaining, gaining any traction? And what do you think are potentially the next steps to try to overcome some of these really disastrous policy um, positions that are being enacted? Well, in the U.S., the Occupy Wall Street movement, I think, is setting the base for what will become a mass movement when we collapse again. So I, I, it's the most important movement we've had in the U.S. since the anti-Vietnam War movement and civil rights before that. It, it will be on that scale. More important than Tea Party? <laughs> <laughs> they were completely taken over by the Republicans. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I hope it's successful, but I actually think there's such a, a schism among workers in the U.K. Really? A complete schism, especially between public and private sectors. So there's still that fight, there's, there's that strong rivalry, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Divide and rule. Divide. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very afraid that this is not going to take off at this moment. I'm, I'm very afraid that everybody's so scared about what's going on in Europe at this moment that everybody's holding their breath in a way and looking around like like rabbits in the, in the headlamps of a car and, and, and see the car thundering down to them. and. I'm paralyzed by fear. That's my perception that maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. <laughs>
Just a couple, two more questions. Uh, actually, Randy mentioned that uh, Germany actually wants uh, to bail out the uh, its, Germany and France want, wants to bail out its bank. And that is why uh, they want to uh, basically keep the, keep the European Union intact. But I would say that it, it could also be a political thing. Uh, in the larger context, if you see Asia is rising, uh, and in particular, China is rising. It could be that uh, Europe uh, basically still wants to have a say, and since if it is big in terms of its, its political handling, uh, it will have more say in the future. Uh, and, and the question which I want to ask here, here, can or should China bail out the EU? If not, why not? <laughs> well, I, I think it's a completely silly uh, proposal. The, the East, they don't need China. The ECB could do it in one day. ECB could solve this problem in one day. Just announce, we will buy all sovereign government debt at 3% interest. That'd be the end of the story. They don't need to go to China. <laughs> I, I'd be, I'm not anti-China, but I would be suspicious of taking huge loans from anybody. I mean, it's ironic, isn't it, that, uh, that we, we're thinking about a European crisis, but in terms of per capita income, Europe's a very advanced country and China's still a very poor country. Yeah. And the mendicants are going across to the pop, impoverished to, to get some, uh, some bread. It's just an absolute bloody joke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just, just to make one observation, which was uh, Obama's visit to Australia uh, and, and some of Obama's <coughs> speech where he was saying that or less saying that the U.S. may in the future be looking uh, uh, looking west rather than east, looking towards the Pacific rather than the Atlantic. The way that was reported in the U.K. newspapers was quite interesting. It's almost like uh, Britain and, and perhaps Europe were feeling somewhat like spurned lovers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last question, please. I just had a question about the situation in the U.K. Um, Earlier this year, I was at a social welfare forum in Parliament House, Canberra, and two or three of the shadow ministers were quite enthusiastic about the UK's big society where mm -hmm. local communities are going to get stronger and we're going to have smaller government. Do you think in recent, over the events of recent months, this totally discredited that move, or do you think we should be really concerned about it? Um, <laughs> um, I mean, is there evidence of stronger communities which are you know, dealing with this situation? Of course not. Um, I still come back to this idea of schism. Um, you know, um, I, I'd have to think. I'd have to think. I'll see. The, the, my answer to says is that it's uh, it's another one of these neoliberal plots. Uh, it's in the, it's akin to social entrepreneurship that you have a very heavy macroeconomic constraint imposed upon <laughs> for employment creation, and somehow individual enterprise and community enterprise yes. will suddenly find the aggregate demand. Well, it doesn't work like that. Do I'm not against individual and Jeez. community enterprise creating some opportunities for disadvantaged people in their local areas. But you still need to have enough aggregate spending, and you can't have that. Go back to my first point, spending equals income. <coughs> Governments have to spend if other sectors are not spending. Copy. Okay, so everyone's ready for more interview. <laughs> so thank the audience and thank the young uh, audience. <laughs> <laughs>